this is the last message in the series, All Things New. Let's do a little bit of recap and go back over some of the topics that we have talked about. Uh, Beth talked about new assignment. You remember that? In the first message, talked about new assignment. Some of you went out of here and you just said, man, I am on new assignment. And then the second week, she talked about get, getting ready for something new. All right? And getting ready for things that are, that are new is making sure that you leave the old. Okay? Don't keep dabbling in the old. Keep looking for the new. Then we had Easter Sunday. Oh, my goodness. Did we ever have Easter Sunday? Wow. Easter Sunday was, I mean, from beginning to end, it was like, I, I just, you know, I just want to have Easter Sunday every week, but it was just flat out awesome. You know, we had to, in that second service, in the first service, I was like, oh my goodness, it's so full in here. And in the second service, they were, they were going everywhere throughout the building just to find chairs to put people in here. And we just packed them in. I love it when stuff like that happens. But on Easter Sunday, I was talking to you about a new way of thinking. And then last week, so many people just giving their life to Jesus and choosing to be baptized and, and to go public with their faith in Jesus. We baptized last week in two services, 22 people. Come on, let's give them a big hand. Now, all of those titles really go with the theme of this series. This week, I want to title this message, Just Ask Nick. And you say, what in the world does that have to do with this series, All Things New? But I'm going to talk to you about the way to eternal life. The way to eternal life. And we're just going to ask Nick. All right? That's what we're going to do. So this, if there was one man that you could talk to down through the history of time that would have somewhat of an understanding, because I want you to just think of this right now, that eternal life is a spiritual thing. It's not really something you're ever going to understand, Okay? This is, this is something in the future. This is something beyond what you can comprehend. Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for us. That's what we call faith. It takes faith to believe in these things. But if you were going to talk to a man, and we'll go all the way back into the Bible. Somebody that could give us somewhat of an explanation on what eternal life is, it would be this man called Nicodemus. And we find this story of this conversation. It, it's a historic conversation that he has with Jesus on how does a man have eternal life. And this question, this conversation is still happening today. It's a common conversation. It's especially a common conversation on people's deathbeds or in the hospital. You know, sometimes uh, even in the hospital, people that we don't know, we'll have nurses or, or doctors or somebody contact the church and say, hey, could you send somebody to talk to so-and-so. Well, sure. It's a conversation that is still happening today. And people are wondering, how do I receive eternal life? I know you hear it every single week here. But there's such a depth to this understanding, this, this, this realm of, the spiritual realm of receiving eternal life. But what makes it so deep is that it's so simple. 
But man wants to make it so complicated. That's why we keep talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and talking about it because we want to make it complicated. And the more we talk about it and the more we complicate it, the less people want to know about it. So the real struggle in this conversation is to make it as simple as can be. Now, I want to go deep here today, but I want to finish with just asking Nick, what did you get out of this conversation with Jesus? So we really got to look to Jesus' answers in this conversation with Nick. So let's go to John chapter 3. And just before, just before I start reading the scripture, I want to kind of set the stage for this conversation. Because Jesus, he is beginning his three-year ministry, okay, to tell people why he's there on the earth, how he came there, why he came there, and what he's about to do and die on the cross. And he's, he's come to the earth to make all things New. That's his mission. His father has sent him to the earth to make all things new. Now, in my Easter message, I talked about John the Baptist. Remember, he was the transitional message between the old and the new. The Bible says he was the forerunner of Jesus. So he was like in the middle of the old and the new, and he came with a new message, transitioning people out of the Old Testament to the New Testament. But the difference in this story is Jesus is the new. Jesus was not the transition. John was the transition. The message that he spoke was the transition. Remember when when, when Jesus was coming down to be baptized and, and, and John just said, look. Because it was Jesus that was coming. He just said, look. I think the most important word in the transition of John teaching people what it is to get eternal life because everything is going to change from the Old Testament to the New Testament is this one word, if I can make it as simple as possible today, it's look. Look. He says, look, and it was Jesus. And then he was like, he himself was like, whoa, I can't baptize this guy. Look, I mean, he's captivated with Jesus. Uh, What it was was an invitation. Much simpler than even what we do today. And I try every time we're doing uh, the invitation to salvation. I'm thinking, how do we even make it simpler? And I was reading this. It's like John says, look. Like just finish the message every Sunday with, hey, look. Yeah, but just look. It's that simple. It's Jesus. He loves you. He wants to change your life. Just look his way. Think of it, the thief on the cross. He didn't even ask Jesus into his heart. Well, that'll mess with Airborne's theology. Because everything we do is to tell people to ask Jesus into your heart. Now, I do think that that's part of the teaching, okay? Okay. Even when we ask people to repeat after us and we lead them in a prayer of salvation, understand that doesn't save people. What that is, is just a teaching. That's like a lesson. This is what you're doing. You're headed toward a belief in Jesus. But it could be as simple as, look. So it's when people look toward Jesus, because this thief on the cross, he did not ask Jesus into his heart. And that messes with my theology. But what he did was he's like, I don't know who you are. Again, we try to do everything we can to tell people who Jesus is. He said, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you come from. I don't even know if you really have a kingdom, but I do know they call you king. But wherever you're going, when you get there, 
Jeans were dying today. How about you remember me? And I'll remember you. And Jesus himself didn't even close the deal. Well, listen, repeat after me. Now, I'm not making light of that. I am not. That's teaching, okay? That doesn't save people. But that is, that's teaching, okay? We need to teach people. We need to bring some understanding of a knowledge to just lead them to the spiritual part where Jesus comes in and does the work and they have nothing to do with that. But what they say does not change them. It's what Jesus does that changes them. I think he wants us to look to the cross today and understand this. That there are a lot of people looking toward Jesus. And I think the message he wants to give us from the cross today is stop making this so complicated. This is so simple. Just tell them to look. This is in my heart because I feel like I, I just led like a hundred people to Jesus this weekend. I've, I've been in Vegas. Matter of fact, I made two trips to Vegas this week and uh, there was a big expo there and there was some products we were interested in, in, in buying and I just ended up talking to so many people, so many people. And it always gets around to our church, always does. My whole life is about the church and about this amazing story of Airborne. And, and, and I just, you know, I, I read this and I'm like, whoa, maybe, maybe these people were listening to me and I didn't have anybody kneel at any altar anywhere or anything like that. But there was a lot of people that were really listening to me. Maybe they did look. I don't know, but I do know this. I'm going to do my best to make this message simple. In this message, we're going to see how Jesus makes all things new. Now, what makes this conversation interesting is that Nick, Nicodemus, we'll call him Nick for short. Nick is a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, he is a biblical teacher. He's actually a biblical lawyer. That'll help you understand it. He's an expert in the law. Okay? So he's a biblical lawyer. He's a member of the Jewish council. He was Jerusalem's most outstanding teacher. Most outstanding Bible teacher on the law of Moses. He knows what it takes to please God. And he's like, a lot. A lot, because that's what he taught. When people came to ask Nicodemus, what does it take to please God? He's like, a lot. This is going to take you a lifetime to figure this out. But then Jesus, the other part of the conversation, he also is a teacher. So it's two teachers having a conversation. And Nicodemus, Nick, he's an expert on the old. And Jesus is an expert on the new. And Jesus, he's an expert on the future. Nick is an expert on the past. And Jesus speaks things into existence. But Nicodemus talks about things that have just happened. Two different teachers here in this conversation. And if you want to know who wins, Jesus. And the Pharisees spent their whole lives just trying to Uh, condemned Jesus and they thought they succeeded by killing him and hanging him on the cross, putting him in the tomb. And they're like, whoa, this, this, this dude's not physical. He's spiritual. And we don't understand that. We just lost this battle. But Nicodemus, he was one of the teachers that was interested because when he looked, he saw something. Didn't understand it. He understands everything he knows. He's an expert. He's a lawyer. He knows, he knows all of the law. But when he looked, he saw something. Okay? So let's get into it. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. 
And after dark one evening, that was, uh, he chooses after dark. Why? Because he's got a reputation. <laughs> he's got a reputation as the other Pharisees do. Like, this is the guy we want to kill. I don't want to be seen with him actually asking questions that I'm interested in. So after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. He calls him rabbi. The other Pharisees wouldn't have. Rabbi, he said. We all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. In other words, he's saying, God's with you. He's not with me. So he's, he's admitting that I don't have this connection that I see that you have. So he's interested in that connection. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, everybody say born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? Exclaimed Nicodemus. Now this is the smartest teacher of all the Old Testament. What do you mean? Exclaimed Nicodemus. And Nick was highly educated, but this was like his first day at school with a new teacher. It's like, whoa, that's a, that's a pretty big question right there. All his deg degrees could not help him understand what Jesus meant by being born again. And so Nick knows a lot about God, but Nick doesn't know God. So now he's asking questions about how to know God. John chapter 3 and verse 4. Nick asks, how, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again. Now, clearly, by asking this question, he's wondering how to achieve salvation. How to achieve salvation. Because Jesus just mentioned something uh, physical and spiritual, but he only asks a question about the physical. He's like, I understand being born so how does that happen for an old man to go back into his mother's womb and be born again? See, he understands how to achieve things. He understands the law. He understands Old Testament. Re remember, he's an expert. And so he understands all this stuff, but he can't figure this one out. And so clearly by asking this question, he is saying, what do I got to do to achieve salvation? And in John 3 and verse 4, or John 3 and verse 5, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and the spirit. He's talking both physical and spiritual Humans, so he clarifies that in verse 6. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So Nick understands physical things. Physical way of life, physical way of worship, physical way of pleasing God. I mean, in, in the Old Testament, they had 613 laws. He knew them all by memory. He could litigate any conversation, any argument with anybody that wanted to say otherwise. You do not go up against Nick. Nick knows his stuff. He knows how to please God. And his effort in his whole life of the Old Testament was how do I achieve this salvation? How do I really please God? Because you're telling me everything that I know to do is not getting the job done. But Jesus is going to help him with it. And so in verse 7, he says, Nick, don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. I, I, I just feel like the Lord taking me back to the cross again. We try to get a method out of the cross and that thief coming to know Jesus. <laughs> what does Jesus tell us about the cross and the thief when he said, today you'll be with me in paradise? He answers it right here. He says, you can't explain that. You can't even explain salvation. It's not even a method. Right. It's 
It's not a one, two, three step. You go through our class, you learn about this, that, and the other, and be baptized and do the whole thing. It's not, it's not a method. He said, you can't explain it. It just happens. Why? Because God does it. So he's, he's given some physical imagery to Nicodemus that he understands what wind is and he knows he can't see it and he can't explain it, but he does see the effects of it. So he's trying to help him understand a, pr- a spiritual principle. <clears throat> so he says, think of the wind. That's what Jesus says. Nicodemus, just think of the wind. You can't command it to come. So Jesus said, you can't command it to come. You can't make the wind blow is what he said. You can't walk outside and say, wind come, blow on me. We sing songs that says, breathe on me, Holy Spirit. We can't make that stuff happen. We can't, we can't command, command the wind to blow. This morning I, I went outside. I just wanted to feel what the temperature was. Woo, the wind was blowing. Now I looked out and I thought, you know what? That beautiful pear tree out on our front lawn is just blooming and white. It's just absolutely gorgeous this morning. For a brief time this morning, the sun was actually shining. So I was like, wow, sun's shining. And, uh, and the birds were chirping. It was absolutely beautiful. I could see the birds. I could see the tree. I could see the sun peeking through the clouds. And I thought, oh, it's just a beautiful morning. But whoo, I better get a coat on. It's chilly. I mean, it's just chilly. Why? Because the wind was blowing. Now, I couldn't see the wind, but I got to tell you, more than the sun, more than that beautiful tree and the beautiful song that the birds were singing that I could see up in that tree, the wind was having a greater effect on my life than all three of them together, and I couldn't see it. You can't explain. We do our best, but we really can't explain how the wind comes and changes our lives. So he says the new birth being born again, Nick, is just like that. It's just like that. You can't command it to come. You can't make it occur. You just, you, you just have to resign to the fact that you got to do nothing and let God do his work. That's just messing with his theology because he spent his whole life learning how to please God and learning how to get to God. And now Jesus just tells him his whole life was a big waste. Not really, but that's what he's thinking. He says, you got to resign to the fact that God is like the wind and you can't command him to give you eternal life. But you can stand still outside and let the wind blow on you. Or you can go and hide where the wind ain't blowing. But Jesus was also saying, I think you know, Nick, the wind blows everywhere. So just go let people know the wind's blowing. Say, look, you feel that? Well, I don't see nothing. No, I know you don't see anything. But boy, the wind blowing today. You can really mess with people a little bit. Say, look, what? Uh, the wind is, it, it, it's, it's, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh no, the wind's really blowing. I said, you, you don't, you, you can say, I don't, I don't see that and you don't see that, but boy, you really feel the effects of it, don't you? I said, yeah, yeah. That, and you can lead them to the Lord right there. Said, Look. So Jesus is teaching Nick that eternal life comes from the wind. Now I want to take it a little bit deeper with that. We talked about this when we gave our new name to you airborne. And I want to go back to it. And I want to, I want to keep going back to this over time so that you never lose it. The Greek word for what Jesus uses here in the wind is pneuma. And the same word in the old Testament is ruach. So the Hebrew word ruach is air in motion. Now it means many things, air in motion, wind, breath, life, or breath that gives life. In the New Testament, which was written in the Greek, we have the word pneuma, which pretty much means the same thing, but it goes to a new level, air in motion, wind, breath, life, and soul. Because now the wind is going to change people's soul and prepare them 
for eternal life. So it takes on new meaning or breath that gives life. Now the word air indicates creative activity and life-giving power that comes from God. It's quite a definition of air, isn't it? Can I tell you again? The word air, because this, this word that Jesus uses, wind, which means air in motion, pneuma, air in motion, that's one of the meanings. So this word air indicates creative activity and life-giving power that comes from God. Man, that's what's happening when the wind's blowing. Jesus was saying, God's breath is like the wind and it brings life. Now, this is where we get the name airborne. You thought it was because I was a pilot and, and had an airstrip and I fly airplanes. I understand that works, but we were not going to change our name to airborne until God gave me a revelation. Our whole team, they just loved it when I told them to, but I got to have a revelation of it. There's got to be something more to it because I don't want our church just to be known for all we're an aviation church. That, that just doesn't fulfill our mission. And so this is where the name airborne came from. Air, Ruach. The wind, breath that gives life, air, born, we understand born, and if you're born of the air, then you're airborne. And to be airborne is to be reborn of the breath that gives life. I'm born of my mom, but I want to be airborne too. I want to be, I want to be Ruach born. I want to be Numa born. I, I, I want to be born from the wind that comes from God. I want that new birth. I want that new spirit within me. So Jesus says, so don't be surprised when I say you must be airborne. That's what he said. In the, in the physical, in the real translation of what he was saying, being born again, he was saying, don't be surprised when I say you must be Ruach born or Numa born or airborne. That's where airborne comes from. Now, I told you I was in Vegas this past week and I made a second trip, but I was talking to a gentleman the uh, day before yesterday and, uh, and the conversation was going really good. And then he asked me, he said, do you have a card? And my first trip out, I didn't have any cards. So that's why I flew all the way back, no, <laughs> to get my cards. But I had my cards the second time. I was well prepared. He said, do you have a card? And I handed him the card. And he's just looking at the card. He said, airborne. He said, where did, where did, where did you get that name? And he said, and what, you know, what, what, does, what does that mean? I mean, is that, is that an aviation church? He said, are you a pilot or something? And I had, to get, I had to get him off that. I said, no, actually, I'm a pastor. He says, oh, you're a pilot and a pastor. Well, yeah, I am. But more importantly, I'm a pastor. And, uh, and he, said, he said, oh, so back to my question, uh, where did you get the name Airborne? And I said to him, I said, well, if you can simply believe that the air you breathe comes from a living God that's always intended for you to have eternal life, you can be born again. I mean, he was really running the conversation up until that point. And now he's trying to take a physical understanding of airborne, and now he's like, he just heard airborne in a whole different way, and he's trying to put the two... But I, like Jesus, knew what he was thinking, just like Jesus knew what Nicodemus was thinking. He didn't understand the spiritual side of it. And so I tried to help him with it. And I said, well, you, I mean, you, you believe in, in the air, the, you know, the wind blows, the wind's blowing today. He said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, well, if you believe in the air, then you're, you're, you're already almost all the way home. And it's like, <laughs> he looks at me again. I said, well, if you believe in the air... And then the second most important thing, it comes from somewhere. So God is the creator of the earth. And so God makes the wind blow wherever he wants to make it blow. So if you believe that that air comes from a living God, that he's always intended for you to have eternal life, that's a pretty awesome gift. That means you can be born again. You can have new life. And he said, 
No, I can't tell you that part. <clears throat> he said, holy cow, that's better. He says, that's amazing. That's quite an analogy. Now he boiled that down to an analogy, but I'll submit to you that the thief on the cross, all he had was a real life analogy. He didn't understand a stinking thing. One thing he knew was that he was a sinner. One thing that he was thinking about was that they say he's a king. Tell you what, we're dying here together today. You remember me and I'll remember you. And wow, today you'll be with me in paradise. Let me finish by saying this. It's one of my points here. What Jesus is saying is you can't get eternal life. You receive it. You can't go get it. You receive it. It's like just going outside, standing in the wind, doing nothing, and let the wind take its effect on you. Whatever it blows your way, it comes. And it has a profound effect on people's lives, the cars they drive, the air they breathe. I mean, think of it. The wind creates life. It's everywhere. God is omnipresent. Why? Because he's in the air. He's in the wind. See, God, I just, I just want to show you that Nic Nicodemus' problem was he was trying to find a way to get eternal life. And Jesus says you can't get it. You can't understand. You can't even understand it. You can't, you can't, it's not a physical thing. You can't go get it. You receive it. See, good people don't go to heaven. Good people would be things they do to make them good. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. And you can't forgive yourself. Jesus forgives you. Jesus cleanses you. His breath that gives life, ruach, pneuma, that's everywhere, has a profound effect on your life. It's that simple. Let me say it again. If you can believe that the air you breathe comes from a living God that always intended for you to have eternal life, then you can be born again. And in that statement, you do nothing. The wind, his breath that gives life, does the eternal work in your heart. Then he seals it. Puts his stamp of approval on you. So if it's never anything that you do that is good, if you never do one more good thing in your life, you had the best thing that ever happened to you. And there's no fairness in that. See, we want things to be fair. We want it to be a process. We want to be able to look at somebody and say, now that is a follower of Jesus. But you can't do that because they're not the ones that makes that happen. They're not the ones that makes themselves a Christian. It's the air. It's God. They do nothing. It's like standing out in the wind and just saying, God, then you do this.